This is the great dome of the famous round reading room at the heart of London's British Museum. And it's the setting for our new exhibition on China's first emperor and his terracotta army. I'm Neil McGregor, the director of the museum, and this is an archer. He's made of clay, he's over 2,000 years old, and he has 7,000 companions back in Western China. The Chinese terracotta warriors are probably the most famous army in the world today and they embody one of the greatest dreams of all history. They were dreamt up by a man whose likeness we may never know, although many artists over the centuries have guessed at it. China's first emperor, the man who over 2,000 years ago shaped one of the great countries of the modern world. The man who made the terracotta army is also the man who made China. Xi'an, the present-day capital of Shanxi province in West China. 2,300 years ago, this land belonged to the state of Qin, one of the seven independent states making up a large part of what we now know as modern China. About 40 minutes from Xi'an, clouds hang about the slopes of Mount Li. At the foot of this once sacred mountain lies a distinctive pyramid-shaped mound. It contains the tomb of the man who became the first emperor of China. To this day, the emperor's tomb is undisturbed, although the historian Sun Qian gave an account of what it contained. The tomb was filled with models of palaces and pavilions, and offices as well as fine vessels, precious stones and rarities. All the country's streams, the Yellow River and the Yangtze, were reproduced in mercury, and by some mechanical means made to flow into a miniature ocean. The heavenly constellations were shown above, and the regions of the earth below. The tomb is just one element of a vast underground complex, which is still largely intact. It is incredibly tantalizing to wonder what is inside this tomb mound, especially when we have this beautiful, wonderful description by Sima Qian of the wonders that are in there, the rivers of mercury, the constellations, the treasures, the crossbows set up with triggers so that people will be shot as they come in, the lamps um, fueled with whale oil to burn forever, I mean, it's, it's a wonderful description. Whether it's true or not, who knows? The first emperor was born in 259 BC. He became king of Qin, aged just 13, and only a few years later he led his armies into battle. At that time, China was made up of warring states of more or less equal power, but gradually the king of Qin overtook them all. If we look back today, in 2007, at the first emperor, we see him standing like a pivot. To me, he's the crucial figure involved in the unification of China. Before him, in the 3rd century BC, there is a large territory covered by different states, some of them at war, some of them not. After him, there is the country we know today as China, a large, enormous state, somewhat the size of a major part of North America. This is an enormous country, much bigger than anything in Europe at the time or later. From the moment he became king at the age of 13, the first emperor had begun to plan his tomb. And as emperor, the scale of his plans fully matched his new unprecedented status. His aim was no less than to rule, above ground or below, forever. He is concerned about his life after death. He's afraid of dying. Aren't we all? 
And don't we all try to do something about it, such as take medicines to avoid sudden death? What is an aspirin a day, after all? So the first emperor clearly was afraid of dying, and perhaps he expressed it very forcibly in trying to hide from assassins. Assassination, if you're a great ruler, is around the corner all the time. Well, the emperor was interested in sending people to the islands in the Eastern Sea that are known as Peng Lai. In Peng Lai, there were supposed to be special herbs growing, which, if you could collect them, might make medicines that would give you long life, or perhaps immortality, help you to avoid death. And the, the word is not immortality, but non-dying. And on these islands, which are mountainous, you might meet with the spirits who understood the recipes. and. Spirits who had special secrets, who knew about non-dying, were to be found on high places. That's another reason for the emperor to climb these mountains and have his inscriptions written up there. He's not just addressing us, indeed he doesn't know about us. He's addressing the spirits as much as the people of the time. Ideally, the first emperor just wanted to go on living. He wanted to go on being emperor, and he thought somehow that might be possible. Of course, in the hearts of hearts, he probably knew it wasn't. Hence, this enormous tomb. But the tomb is in itself astonishing. Nothing like it had been constructed earlier. But it's only the first emperor who creates this monstrous tomb with large, large deposits around them. The tomb complex for the first emperor is one of the most extraordinary cultural achievements in history. It measures 56 square kilometers with pits radiating from the central tomb mound. Nearly 600 pits have been identified but most of them are yet to be excavated. We already know from those uncovered that this is much more than a tomb guarded by soldiers. The emperor was building a parallel universe recreating his entire empire below ground. We're still only at the beginning of understanding what this huge other world contained, but nothing yet found matches the stunning scale of the Emperor's terracotta army. Over 7,000 soldiers stand in two huge pits about one and a half kilometers east of the tomb mound. Pit 1 contains the main army. There are foot soldiers, armored officers, chariots drawn by four horses each, and cavalry. They stand in formation between walls of tamped earth, once lined with wood, three meters high. The pits were looted and burned sometime after the death of the emperor. In the destruction, many of them were broken, and the roof of the tomb collapsed, filling the pits with earth, so that when they are excavated, a slow, ongoing process, they have to be extricated one by one from the earth, and painstakingly stuck together again. This is about an attempt to exercise power in the realm beyond the palpable, the material, the real. And there's a sense in which, you know, the in a way, the, the, those that died in the making, as well as those that are commemorated by the overall project, are somehow haunting the, 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 these works. It is absolutely extraordinary to produce so many life-sized warriors, figures in terracotta. And of course it's not only the warriors, it's all the other terracotta figures that are gradually being excavated. So they've now found terracotta um, bureaucrats, civil officials, 
in one pit to show that the em emperor wanted not only an army for the afterlife, but he wanted a government, a civilian government, to um, to run his administration in the afterlife. The civil officials, members of the imperial administration, are recognizable by their wide sleeves covering clasped hands, and also by the writing tools hanging from their waists. And there are other discoveries that have been made in other pits around the tomb site. Two half-life-sized painted bronze chariots were discovered to the west of the tomb mound, each drawn by four horses and buried with real hay. This is a comfortable chariot with a roof. We imagine for the first emperor to travel around his empire in the afterlife. And then we've, we've also found terracotta acrobats and strong men and musicians for entertaining the emperor in the afterlife. And all of these are life-size and realistic and um, made in the same way. It's interesting to compare the terracotta warriors and the acrobats because the terracotta warriors are lots and lots and lots of them in rows and are quite static. But the acrobats, for example, are much more lively. They have um, very curvaceous bodies. The strong man, for example, has a very curvaceous body, big muscles, very, very lifelike. And the way that the acrobats are pointing their fingers, crossing their hands, it looks as if they've just com completed a trick. Probably he was balancing something on his finger. And in fact, there's a hole through the finger for fixing something onto the top. It's thought maybe it was a plate or maybe it was a handkerchief. It'd be spinning. The emperor had needed entertainment in the afterlife as well as his government. And not only did he have acrobats, strong men, but also musicians. And the musicians are the most recent finds, actually. The musicians have been found in an underground watercourse, an F-shaped pit which has a sort of stream running through the middle. And beside the stream there are little niches and each of the terracotta musicians is found in a niche along the river. And in the river are rows of swans, geese and crane um, who, are, who are actually sort of fl swimming in the river or walking in the river, dipping their um, beaks into the river. Some think that elsewhere on the site there might even be an underground palace. None of the first emperor's palaces actually survive, but in some cases, like this one, archaeologists have been able to reconstruct the building from the foundations. Several of his most magnificent palaces once stood on the hills to the north of the Qin capital, Xianyang. These palaces were filled with precious objects of jade and of gold, ritual bronze bells and drums captured from his vanquished enemies. There were also, according to later writers, many beautiful concubines who almost certainly followed him to his grave. And while the tomb mound itself has not of course been excavated, in other parts of the tomb complex real human remains have been found. When we look at the tomb of the first emperor we see things that today seem inconsistent, like why does he bury a whole army in clay and then have also buried alongside him tombs in which there are real people, people who may have been generals, who almost certainly were concubines. Why does he mix the two? Well, in the past, there's been a kind of cynical feeling that the second emperor, his son, just wanted to get rid of people he didn't like and just buried them at the same time. I think it's much more complicated than that. I think that where the emperor needed something which could only be made perfect in clay, 
it was made in clay. After all, if you want to make a perfect army with all the different ranks shown properly, if you want them to have all the different attributes that they need and perhaps to be larger than life, because in fact these figures are not small, um, then you may need to make it in clay. So, if you want a perfect army, it's probably best to make it. And by being a perfect analogy, a perfect analogue, it will be, in the afterlife, a perfect army. We're dealing with the afterlife, and we're dealing with people's views about the afterlife, which are rather difficult to actually be precise about. But there are elements of this tomb complex, such as the terracotta warriors, the mixture of the real people together with the terracotta people and then you get the amazing find of a whole pit full of um, armour made out of stone. That's absolutely totally useless so we're dealing with beliefs about the afterlife which are difficult to pin down. Only a fraction of the stone armour has been excavated but it too is astonishing. They're all different kinds of armour in that armoury, probably for different ranks of the people who were buried for real. They needed armour against ghosts and deities, spirits, evil spirits, because stone armour is no good in real life. A metal weapon will destroy it, but it will protect you, it was thought, against a demon's weapon. I'm interested in these surprises as much as what is inside the tomb because the inner tomb may be more like things we know than the birds, the stone army or the ter terracotta warriors have proved to be. Not only do they have to dig an immense pit, it may be 30 or 40 metres down, it's some huge depth down then they have to put a mound on top. They have to put fantastic treasures inside. We can hardly imagine what those would be like. In 210 BC, the emperor died at the age of 49. Despite all the surrounding excavations, the tomb of the first emperor himself is still sealed, and as far as we know, undisturbed. Written accounts make great claims about its contents telling us that it contains a microcosm of the empire with rivers made of mercury which match the great rivers of China, the Yangtze and the Yellow Rivers. Tests have been carried out on the soil within the tomb mound and indeed there are very high levels of mercury. But as the Chinese are excavating very slowly and very prudently, we are unlikely to know soon what really lies within. Oh. 